uh, Dr. Dennis Deer. He's the commissioner of the second district and he represents one of the most diverse districts in Cook County. He's a graduate of Jackson State University where he earned his Bachelor of Science degree at, he, uh, in elementary special education and a master's in science and rehabilitation psychology. He went on to earn his PhD in Christian psychology. Born and raised on Chicago's West Side, he remains a resident of the North Lawndale community and has a very long history of community service in that community. He's also an Illinois Law Enforcement Standards and Training Board Certified Instructor. How do you have time to do all this stuff, Dennis? <laughs> <laughs> he serves on a number of not-for-profit and community boards. And he's not only served uh, the community in many roles as, as an organizer and an executive leadership roles, he he um, he cares about his community, and he j doesn't just um, talk the talk; he walks the walk. I'm going to bring um, Dr. Deer up again. He's a commissioner. He serves on the board of the commission. And uh, Dennis, thank you so much for being with us today. As you know, this is a difficult time for all of us. And I thought that before this month closed out, you'd be the perfect person to speak to us. So with that, go right ahead, sir. Well, thank you so much. It is a delight and a privilege to be here. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk, for the great work that you have done. You have an awesome track record, but thank you for also for that which you are doing now. Um, you are a, uh, I call you a legend. Um, you are a mentor to me. You are someone whose shoulders I stand on. So I want to say thanks. I didn't know that you were so heavily involved in the road. Uh, that's the thing. That's, uh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I was sitting there listening, listening to your, the four principles there. Um, today's topic is one that I am very passionate about. You know, and I'm, I'm thankful for each of you who, spoke to the events that has taken place in Texas. Uh, that event has hurt my heart as, as well as every other event that involves some type of gun violence and people getting killed. Uh, and so our nation is mourning now because we have 19 individuals who have been impacted uh, directly by that, but not only 19, their families, their friends, their church, their community and the United States of America is impacted by the events that took place in Texas. And someone may be asking, well, how does that event relate to our topic today, which is mental health? It relates a lot to our topic. So all of us have some type of feeling that we're feeling today. And as you watch on the news, as they unfold and continue to talk and put faces and names to the victims of the violence that has occurred, there's something that you feel. I wanna go around and hear a little bit about that. Somebody, and I, I'm, I will tell you that I'm not one of those uh, speakers that just do all the talking and you go to sleep. I want you to be involved because that's the only way that this becomes portable to you. And I have a call of action for each of you before we leave today. And so I wanna hear from four or five of you right now as to what, tell me your feeling word. What did you feel as you heard the incident that took place? And don't all, don't all raise your hand at once. Come on, I wanna hear from you. What did you feel? Dr. Dr. Deer? Yes. Now Tally here. It's good seeing you again. We met several times. I remember. Good to see you. Uh, you know, I felt very angered, not just because of the uh, 18 young people who lost their lives since this thing, but the, but I was I was uh, very angered at the fact that uh, it was brought to the attention of the nation when in my in in, in our backyard we lose. 19 young people every two weeks from the same type of violence. You know, not to just minimize it, just 
just the fact that it, 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 it just is becoming commonplace. Very good. Thank you for that. Who else? If I could just throw one word out, um, Dennis, disgust. Disgust at our leaders in Washington. They can do something about this with common sense gun laws. Guns don't kill just, it, it, they don't have legs and get up and walk and just kill people. So disgust. Thank you for that. Who else? Give me a couple more people. This is what, Armanda. What are you feeling? This is Armanda. Um, my response was, um, as I gasped for air, my response was, Lord, have mercy on us. Mm. Just uh, a feeling of despair. Just a uh, hopeless, not hopelessness, but helplessness. Um, Thank you, Amanda. Yeah. Who else? One more. One more. You must have felt something. I, can, I mean, I can go. This is Eric. I would say, why? Why in America? Why are we okay with this? Why? We, I mean, we. It's just mind blowing. This is the only country it happens, uh, you know, in on a regular basis. On a regular I, basis, <laughs> you know, we have mass shootings, and you know, seemingly as Americans, you know, we're 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 okay with this. That's right. It look like we're okay with, it. or that came with this. But I think the most common, <clears throat> the most common feeling is anger. The most common feeling that I've heard has been anger. Let me give you a, um, a term, a clinical term that we use that is called systematic desensitization. Systematic desensitization is when you are exposed to a traumatic stimuli and it is traumatic when you are originally exposed to it, but after repeated exposure, it becomes the norm. I'll say that again. Systematic desensitization is when you are exposed to a traumatic stimuli. It is traumatic initially, but after repeated exposure, it becomes the norm. And so we have been exposed to trauma so much that now it just becomes a why or a norm, right? Another one bites the dust. And so we have to be thinking about this because it certainly has an impact on our mental health. We heard from several individuals who said, I felt angry. Somebody said, I felt why, I felt disgust. Well, think about this. You were exposed to trauma and that exposure to trauma has you feeling some type of way. We process that as human beings in a lot of different ways. We can't blame ourselves for it. It's how we process stimuli. But the thing we have to be careful of is that we carry that with us. We carry it around on a daily basis. And so we have to figure out a way to deal with that. One of the things that I found very important here in Cook County, and and Madam Clerk did share with you that I'm a Cook County Commissioner. I declared mental health and the lack of services a public health crisis in Cook County. What does that mean? That means that mental health, we have to view it as an issue of public health. And when we begin looking at it as an issue of public health, we can start looking at ourselves. Now, let me, let me, I'm gonna ask you to use your show of hands, just raise your hand on the screen. Use your show of hands and tell me how many people have been to counseling before. Let me see your hand. And if you don't want us to know, just blink your eyes. If you, for those of you who don't have your screen on, press your hand raise function on your phone. Let me see who actually have been to counseling before. I see five so far. Six, seven, somebody clapping their hands. They went twice, that's good. 
who are seven, I see seven individuals. Let me turn the screen, okay? Eight, nine, 10, 11. All right, we got 11 individuals who have gone to counseling before. Thank you for saying that you have been to counseling before. Let me tell you what the problem is about mental health and why it's so important that Madam Clerk have us talking about this today. Today is, this month is Mental Health Month. And I declared it in Cook County as Mental Health Month too. May the 19th, I declared as Mental Health Day because that is very, very important. One of the issues with us and mental health is that we don't pay no attention to it. We have been caused to believe that if I go and seek out counseling, that means that I'm crazy. And I say to people, you crazy if you don't go, right? Your mental health is a part of healthcare. Mental health is a part of healthcare. When we are exposed to that stimuli, such as the Columbine shootings, the shooting that has happened in, in Texas, the shooting with the grocery store that took place in New York, we're exposed to traumatic stimuli. And guess what? Those sites that we see, we retain them up here. We retain them up here. And guess what? Some of us are trying to figure out why we're walking around with high blood pressure, why we're walking around with anxiety, why sometimes we have depression, and it's because we have unchecked issues that we're dealing with. Let me give you an example. I was born in North Lawndale. That's on the west side of Chicago. Any west side is here? All right, west side. West side of Chicago. Born and raised there. At 10 years old, I witnessed my first murder. 10 years old. Now, my parents didn't believe in counseling, right? So I was 10 years old, witnessed that murder. The police came around. They were asking questions. My parents didn't let me talk to them. And guess what? I decided then that I was going away to college and I was going to get what society needs, I say to succeed, come back and build my community up. And I did just that. But I didn't get counseling, guess what? Until I got to college. So I was walking around with PTSD. Anybody know what that means? Who knows what PTSD? I'm, I'm Mike and tell. What does PTSD mean? I'm Mike and tell. Post traumatic stress disorder. My man, thank you, Brian. Thank you. Post-traumatic stress disorder. I was walking around with PTSD and I didn't even know it. I was walking around down the street, me mugging people, mad for no reason at all. And I never knew why I was so mad. I never knew why I didn't smile. But I found out when I got to counseling because I was harboring and holding all of the gunshots I heard at night, the murders that I saw, all of that was right here. So let me ask you a million dollar question. Did I have mental health issues? Raise your hand if you think I did. I see a few hands. People who are not on the screen, raise your hand, raise your hand signal. Did I have mental health stuff going on? I see a few people. Some of y'all think so. All right, hands down. Who don't believe I had mental health stuff going on? You raise your hand if you don't believe it. You think I was good. I see two hands, okay. I did, the correct answer is, I had some mental health stuff going on. I had PTSD going on and I didn't even know it. PTSD, because I saw a murder and never really talked it out. Never really talked about what I felt about that, what I had seen. I pushed it down on the inside, right? And a lot of people were walking around with that. Now that doesn't mean that you super that you crazy or anything like that. That means I have I have conflict that I have not resolved. Most people are walking around with mental health issues which are unresolved conflict. Doesn't mean that you need psychotropic medications. It just means that you need to deal with that unresolved conflict. Now, some of you all figure, and I'm going to give you a golden nugget here. This wasn't even part of the conversation. I'm going to give it to you, though. 
For those of you all who still trying to find somebody to love you, right? Whoever out there, you looking for your husband, wife, so forth and so on. Don't look for nobody till you take care of yourself. All right? Sometimes we take baggage from previous relationships or previous times that we've been traumatized and we take that and put it off on somebody else. So we don't even know what an unhealthy relationship look like, right? We think we healthy, but we are not healthy at all. Why? What do you see with? Somebody on mic can tell me, what do you see with? Eyes. Who said that? You see, who, who believe you see with your eyes? Raise your hand. That's a great answer. Who else believe you see with your eyes? Raise your hand. All right. What if I was to tell you, you don't see with your eyes? What if I was to tell you, you do not see with your eyes? Because you don't. You don't see with your eyes. You see through your eyes. You see with your mind. Now watch this that I'm getting ready to say to you. We don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. Let me say that again. We don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. We see with our mind. We see through our minds. We see through our eyes, but we see with our minds. So guess what? Mom, I had an old school mom. And my mama told me that if you're around anybody who was depressed, you was going to be depressed. She said, you think, therefore, you are. And I said, well, mama, that don't make much sense. But I went to school, and I started reading my psychology books, and I figured the professors must have heard my mama, right? Because all the stuff she told me was in the books. So you don't see with your eyes. You see through them, but you see with your mind. Therefore, we don't see things as they are. We see them if we are. If I'm a jealous person, whether the people around me are jealous or not, what am I going to see? Jealousy, right? Now, we still talking mental health. I'm going to take you back home in a minute. We still talking mental health. I'm trying to get you to a point that you understand we have to change the way that we think, right? This is about a paradigm shift taking place in order for us to be in a healthy place from a mental health standpoint, right? So we have to begin to change our mindset. We have to begin to change the way that we think and perceive mental health, because this is all about our health. Even the work that you're doing with the Rotary Club, the work that you're doing in the clerk's office, wherever you work, this has an impact on the way you see yourself and your mental health. Now, one thing that becomes very, very important is that education is never neutral. It is either liberating or oppressive. Education will either put you in bondage or it will set you free. And that's what comes into play when we start talking about mental health. Mental health is a public crisis. And according to national statistics, one in five adults experience mental health issues. One in two, now mental health issues are different than serious mental health issues. Now, let me tell you the difference. All of us have what are called mental health issues. I get people who call me up who want counseling because they got problems in their marriage. They call me up, they want counseling because someone passed away and they have grief. Those are all mental health issues, but they are not mental illness, right? They are not severe mental health issues. The issues don't become severe mental health issues until you have to get to the point where you need what's called psychotropic medications. One in 20 people here in America have severe mental illness. 18% of the adults with mental health issues also have what we call co-occurring disorders. What does that mean? That means a person may have a mental health issue, but they have substance abuse related issues with it. Anybody know why they have substance abuse related issues? Come on, Brian. A lot of times they're self-medicating. Say it again. 
they're self-medicating. Uh, there you go. And they're they moving away self- from pain. They're trying to move again? away. They're trying to move away from the pain. That's right. They're trying to move away from the pain. And just as Brian said, both of those answers are correct. They are self-medicating. Why? Because oftentimes there's pain that's associated there. And if you have a severe mental illness, you're dealing with, if you're dealing with psychotropic medication, and those might be medications that they give you to get rid of some of the effects of your mental illness, those cause cause all kinds of side effects. And so some people with mental illnesses decide I'm not going to take the psychotropic medication. I'd rather get high off drugs because there's less of a side effect and I get a buzz out of it. And so they decide to self-medicate with the drugs. All right. And so keep in mind that all of this is in flow with a campaign of education around mental health. It is very, very important. You need to understand the signs and symptoms of a mental health condition. And if you got your pen and paper, I always tell people whenever you in a lecture with me, you have some pen and paper. You know, I got I got degrees in teaching, so I'm always doing instruction. Here's signs and symptoms. If you got a coworker, you yourself, here's signs and symptoms that they may be dealing with a mental illness. Write these down. If they have exhibited some, some situation or feeling that is outside of the norm for at least two weeks. So maybe they are depressed. See, sometimes, sometimes you got different types of depression. You've got major depression, which is one thing. And then you have situational depression. Situational depression, all of us deal with at some point. Some people don't know how to play a game of spades good. So when they lose, they be depressed because they ain't got no skills, right? And so that's situational depression. That's depression caused by a particular situation. And typically after a day or so, it's gone. Some people are depressed because they broke up in a relationship or whatever various reasons. Those are called, that situational depression. It's caused by a situation. Major depression is not caused by a situation. It is caused by a chemical imbalance within the brain, all right? So a person can wake up and feel down in the dumps for no reason at all. Now, I have seen some people in practice who were grieving a loved one who had situational depression and had turned into major depression because they never left the seven stages of grief. So how do I recognize that if I see that within one of my friends? if they exhibit one of these things for two weeks or more. A rapid change in their eating habits. They start eating a lot more or a lot less. They gain weight real quick or they lose weight real quick over the course of a two week period, right? That's a problem. If they come and tell you, man, I just haven't been sleeping real good. I'm, I'm either sleeping more or sleeping a lot less. That is a a telltale sign and a warning sign. And if any one of those lasts for two weeks or more, that is a problem. You know your friend better than they do sometimes. They don't even recognize the fact that they've had this change in their sleeping or eating habits, right? And so sometimes we have to watch out for that kind of stuff, not only within ourselves, but with, with the people that we love. So make sure you're watching out for that. A change in eating habits, a change in sleeping habit, plus or minus, up or down, and it lasts at least two weeks, and they're exhibiting some type of symptom, whether it's depression, whether it's auditory, visual hallucinations, et cetera. And for some people, there's an uptick in their drinking habits or their drug use habits. And so we want to watch out for that. Those are important things for us to watch out. In particular to this situation that we've seen take place in Texas, you know, oftentimes I heard someone say this, I think it was Madam Clerk, that we have legislators and we have leaders who have not decided to adopt common sense uh, gun, gun, gun reform, right? And so our gun violence is continuing to tick up. And oftentimes we know that this is caused by a mental health condition, right? It's oftentimes caused because this person 
has, has a, a, a mental health condition that is undiagnosed in many cases, all right? And, and in some cases, it may not have been a mental health condition. It could be that this person may have just had some issues that was going on and um, they were unresolved um, within themselves and they just chose to do this particular thing. We don't know what has taken place. We're still waiting on additional information for this person in Texas, but they're saying that it probably wasn't a mental health issue. But I think I, after we, it's all said and done and we interview enough people, this is, is gonna be clear, right? The mom even came up and said, you know, she noticed some stuff within her son that just wasn't right. Uh, but for whatever reason, she didn't go and, and report it. And so we know that this is, is something issue. And I tell people all the time that yes, we can put forth common sense gun reform and gun legislation, but this is a multifactorial issue, which means that, that they, it is important that we deal with it in a, in a multi-tiered way, right? So gun, gun reform is good, but we need to attach that with some legislation around mental health as well, right? We got to do a campaign of education and we can't make no excuses about it. And I agree, somebody putting that in a, in a chat that nobody in their right mind is going to go and do that. I, I agree wholeheartedly. And I believe that this person is probably has an antisocial personality, uh, antisocial personality disorder. Um, and that, that's classified as a person with um, a criminal type mastermind um, uh, situation going on. Uh, but again, we, we can't say that for sure until we get additional information. Uh, everybody following me so far? Let me make sure y'all not sleeping. Everybody following me so far? Absolutely. All right, that sounds fantastic. All right, a little bit more to go. I wanna cover a little bit more ground. It is important that um, as, as we move forward, and this is Mental Health Awareness Month, that we educate ourselves on mental illness and mental health. I've kind of walked through some some ways that you can see and detect mental illness. Um, it is important for you to begin to talk to your family members about it, right? And so this is part of your call to action. Um, this isn't about you learning about mental health and mental illness. It's about you taking the information that we're talking about today and talk to your family members about it. Talk to your family members and your friends about the positive experience of going to counseling and that it is okay to talk to somebody. People do not today feel like others are there for them, right? They, we, we live in a society that we don't talk to each other. I remember growing up, I knew all of my neighbors. Today, neighbors don't even come out and talk to each other, right? So we have to be positioning ourselves to be, do a little bit more than what we're doing. I know that for me, I am a member of a Divine Nine fraternity, um, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. And one of the things that we've done or are doing around mental health is saying that I am my brother's keeper. And part of what I talk about around the campaign of education is I have to go to my brother and talk to them, in particular about if I'm noticing the signs and symptoms of, that he's dealing with a mental health issue. And I need to go to him and say that before it turns into something totally different. All of us have the ability that if we, we put too much on our minds, we'll snap, right? We never want to get to that point. And so that means we have to be talking, having those conversations with our friends, with our families, with our relatives, and ensure that we are telling them about the importance of guiding their mental health and ensuring that they're doing what they need to do in order to be successful. It is important also that we're working with this same mindset on mar with marginalized communities. The African-American, black and brown communities uh, deal with this particular issue the most. It's happening everywhere, but statistics tell us that underserved black and brown communities are dealing with the lack of mental health services more than other communities. And so those of us who are interacting with these particular communities, it's important for us to carry that message. 
is one that I continue to carry on and on again. Um, Socrates said something a long time ago as I prepare to close. He said, if you always do what you've always done, you're gonna always get what you've always got. That's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. I'll, the next one that I'll give is a deerism. That means I'm eating up. In order for you to get something you never had, you gotta do something that you've never done. And that's what we're doing today, a campaign of education around mental health and mental illness. We are our brother and sister's keeper. I like each and every one of you all to go out and spread that word, spread that message. Uh, we do it in forums just like we're having today. I'm happy to come and, and do additional talks or if you got questions, answer your questions for you. But uh, this is what we do. This is for us, this is for our community, and this is the ultimate service. God bless you all. And I'm open for questions now. Wow. Um, so, wow, you gave I mean, certainly me a lot to think about. Um, however, I'm gonna yield to um, the uh, folks who are on the call here. We have a, a question here. What responsibility do we as supervisors, and this is from um, someone who is a, um, in leadership with the clerk's office, um, and he's asking relative to our staff and their mental health, how do we assist the employee exhibiting symptoms? I think that's a great question. And first and foremost, I think that's why I gave some of those symptoms so that you know what you are exhibiting and how you're exhibiting. The good thing about it, there are county employee. We have an EAP that you can call on the back of your insurance card. We got some really good insurance. Um, and you can call that EAP and you can actually ask them to go and seek services, go seek out services. And you can do that confidentially with them. Nobody else needs to, to really know about that. Uh, but you approach them in friendship and, and say to them, you know, hey, I've noticed this. You know, I know that it, it may impact your, your, your work at some point or another. I'm, I'm sure when I'm saying that you exhibited this. You know, it might be a good idea for you to go in and, and talk to somebody about it, right? I mean, I think that's the best thing that you can do. And I will tell you this, oftentimes when people are exhibiting these symptoms, they want somebody to ask them about it. They don't know how to bring it to other people, right? And so I would admonish you to, you know, again, go, and go to them confidentially and say, hey, I've noticed X, Y, Z. Ask them how they feel. Ask them if anything, you know, is there anything they want to have a conversation about and say to them, hey, this is confidential. You know, there are people that you can go and see and, and invite them to go and seek out the services. Uh, Dr. Deer, um, so the, the beginning part of his question asks about responsibility as supervisors and managers to our staff. I think before we can help somebody else, we need to know what we're, how to approach somebody. There's a stigmatism around this whole issue of mental health. And you started off your talk talking about, uh, are you crazy? We probably shouldn't use that word. That's probably an inappropriate it word is. to use. And is there another word that we could use rather than call, calling somebody crazy has a negative connotation. What do you say about that? It is, and, and crazy is the word that has been used for so many years. And actually, it is still being used. We typically say that this person is, is dealing with some issues, right? Or, or that I, I, I oftentimes wouldn't say that the person is crazy. It's just like saying that, you know, calling the person that is under the influence, saying that they are crackhead. That's just as inappropriate, right? And so we want to say that this person is dealing with some, some issues right now, just as we all do. And let's help them to deal with them more accordingly. You said something important, and I want to reemphasize that, Madam Clerk. Mental health, as well as substance abuse, is laden with stigma, right? Some people associate it with a certain class, which is the biggest myth that was ever made, right? Some people associate it with the fact that, you know, people just don't know, they're uneducated. Again, another myth. 
And in addition to that, some people just don't want to be around someone who has a label for mental health or, or quote unquote crazy, right? Because of the stigma attached. And because at the end of the day, it's what most people fear and they don't know about it because of fear, right? And so the purpose of today's talk was to get rid of some of that fear. This isn't uncharted water that you're dealing with. And it's an opportunity for you to ask questions and educate yourself. That way you can educate others. Thank you for that. Um, one of our members, Amanda, is asking, is there a difference between mental health and emotional health? Mental health and emotional health lie together, right? Um, because your emotions are connected to your, your mental health, right? And so some people would say, oh, I'm, I'm more emotional than others. All of us have emotions, right? Some people say that their emotions go on their sleeves. Let me say this, that somebody started out this, this session today talking about anger. And while anger is an emotion, anger is a secondary emotion. It's the only emotion that is secondary. And someone may be asking, what does that mean, anger is a secondary emotion? It means that it's the only emotion out of all the emotions that you have to feel something else before you feel it. So nobody just feels anger. They may be feel betrayed before they feel anger. They may feel depressed because they feel anger. They may be jealous, which caused them to choose to feel anger. And so when we start talking about our emotional health, we can say that it's, it's attached to our mental health, but keep in mind, mental health is a term that we use to talk about all of our health as it relates to the psyche, right? Mental illness is not the same as mental health. Mental illness takes it to another level, which means our mental health um, has, for whatever reason, gone you know, downhill a bit and we need to tend to it. Thank you. Um, another member is asking, given all, all the recent events that have taken place in the world, what tools do you suggest to help us process or cope with the trauma? And how do you know when it's time to seek help? So right now, the best thing in the world that you can do is sit down and have conversations with other people. Just as the gentleman started up earlier saying that, you know, he didn't condone none of the behavior and it disgusted him and some of the rest of you all gave what your feelings were. It's important to talk about it, right? Because if we hold it in, what that does is we're, we're allowing that to take residence in our mind. And when we allow stuff to take residence in our mind, it will will allow it to become unresolved conflict. And then it contributes to what can cause anxiety, what can cause depression. And then you all worked up and amped up and don't, don't even know why you all worked up, but it's because you got all this stuff in here and it's unresolved conflict. So number one, it's important to talk about it. If you're talking about it and you don't see any improvement, you're still anxious, you're still depressed, you still want to beat somebody up, now you need to go and have a conversation with somebody. The, the mistake that oftentimes we make is we wait for stuff to get real, 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 real bad before we seek our help, mm. before we seek our professional help. I can't count the number of times couples have come to me when they mar their marriage not on the rocks, their marriage way out there on land. Not just up there, ain't no water, nowhere around. It. And they expect <laughs> you to work a miracle. Right? No. You suppose it came to me just like you. Perfect analogy. You know how you take your car in every 3,000 miles or whatever for your oil change for those that do that? Some of y'all don't do it. Right? You take it in every 3,000 miles for that oil change because you know what? If you don't, your car is going to break down. So you take it in for routine maintenance before you start having real problems. Do that with yourself. Right? We go to the doctor. If our finger hurting or we got some, we go routine maintenance for your physical. You go get your teeth cleaned every six months. Routine maintenance, you got to do that for your mental health as well. Don't wait for stuff to get way off course before you decide to seek out help. Seek out help when you're still doing pretty good, but you're still having some problems. Um, Dr. Deer, um... You, you mentioned this briefly about grief. Mm. All, all of us um, who 
care about somebody when we lose them we go through this period of grief sometimes it lasts longer for <laughs> some than others i know when my grandmother died um and this was back in 1975 um i went through this i did not get counseling it lasted a while but when probably maybe 30 years later i took someone for grief counseling and had no idea that you know as i sat with that person um i had no idea that i was still dealing with the loss of my grandmother 30 years later can mm -hmm. you um <laughs> I, I couldn't explain it. I mean, it. I didn't realize that that was back in the back of my mind somewhere, and I was still, you know, had some real feelings about it. So, could you sp uh, spend a minute or two? Because I believe that everybody on this call and on this Zoom has lost someone that's near and dear to them. Um, I, I, I honestly believe you never mm -hmm. get over it, but you got to get through it. So could you just spend a minute and talk about Absolutely. Grief? Absolutely. And I will tell you, Madam Clerk, and you know this, uh, at the beginning of COVID, I too was in that number, right? Um, in fact, I was in there two times. So just as COVID kicked in, they didn't pass away of COVID, but I lost my father-in-law first, who was near and dear to me. I've been married to my wife 25 years. We've been together 32 years. I'm still young, y'all. I ain't 50 yet. Um, so, so, but I lost him. He was 101 years old, right? But he was like a father to me, right? Two weeks later, guess what? I lost my own dad, right? So I had two funerals just at the onset of COVID. And because it was at the onset of COVID, guess what? We couldn't have a real funeral. So imagine that. I couldn't even hardly say goodbye. So do you think I went to therapy? Absolutely, because I was angry. I was upset. I was, I was, I was, I felt betrayed. I felt all these different feelings. Uh, and then on top of that, COVID was, was kicking in and we couldn't even really funeral, people really couldn't come. Only family could come, 10 people, right? And that was before we got deep off into Zoom and Zoom and funerals and all that stuff. That hadn't even started yet. So yes, you're absolutely correct. Madam Clerk, there are five stages of grief that we typically go through. Most people, if they don't go to therapy, they don't know about it. But I saw myself go through all five stages. The first one is denial. We don't believe the person is gone, right? So that stage is marked by persistent thoughts about what could have been if that person had not been lost. We also think about what we could have done, right? Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I tell that person that I loved them more? The second stage of grief is bargaining, right? So in bargaining stage, we get marked by persistent thoughts about, about how I could have helped that person or maybe I could have helped prevent that person from dying, right? Only if I had been there a little bit more, right? So that's that second stage. The third stage is depression we get depressed about that person being gone. And this is all normal, right? We're looking at pictures, we're concerned, we're wondering how we can live our life without that person. And because this happened to them, and I see so many people around having a good time walking, hunky-dory, I get angry. That's the fourth stage, anger. It usually happens because we feel helpless, and we feel powerless. Anger oftentimes stems from the feeling that because of that death, I feel abandoned. I feel lost. And why would my father leave me at a time like this? Right? And then through prayer, through time passing, acceptance, which is stage number five. Acceptance is when, after a little bit of time, we actually come to terms with our emotions, with our feelings that we've experienced as it relates to that death or that loss. And guess what? Some people, it takes them years to move from stage one 
to stage five, right? My mother, I lost her in 95, right? I don't think I got to acceptance until probably 2010, which was 15 years later, right? And sometimes I still have trouble accepting them. I mean, I have accomplished more than anybody else in my family. I'm the first to graduate college. My mother wasn't there, right? And I was the first to get a PhD. My mother wasn't there. Heck, I just last year got appointed by the Secretary of, of Health and Human Services of the United States to the National Institute of Health. Mm -hmm. I'm the only black man on the National Institute of Health. And my mother wasn't there. So it's those times that mm -hmm. all the things my mother poured in me, when I have those accomplishments, acceptance is always tricky. Right, but I know she's looking down on me from above. And so, so it takes time. And sometimes what I found myself having to do, particularly with my father, is you have to go and seek out counsel. Right, and I knew it because I found myself not crying when my father passed away. I was being strong for everybody else. I found myself, when I go to the Botanic Gardens, and I'm walking somewhere in a beautiful field, I just break free, right? And crying and not even know why I'm crying, but then it comes to me that this is, this, I'm crying because I'm, I'm still mourning the loss of my mother and the loss of my father, right? But I've come to terms with that. We have to make a choice to do that. And I've chosen to understand that in my own grief, um, there is promise, right? Because at the end of the day, and I'll tell you what my counselor said to me, and yes, the counselor does have a counselor. He said something important to me. He said that when you are, when you understand that your mother, what your mother and your father poured into you, they're never really even gone. You're living out their legacy and you continue on. The same thing happened, and Madam Clerk knows this, with my friend, mentor, and brother, Robert Steele. Same thing, too. I haven't got to acceptance yet, even with him. That's a little bit fresher. It's only been five years, but I, I'm, I'm not there yet. With him, I'm close, but I'm not there. But one thing that gives me um, pause, but it gives me excitement, is that I know the work that I'm doing now I'm living at his legacy. Everything that he started, I put a bull in. Now, right here in Chicago, and even at the national level at NACO, I put a bull on everything he started. But we still got work to do. I hope I answered your question. I was doing a little yes, bit myself. Did. I yes, did a little did. bit myself, Madam Clerk. They, look, look, uh, Commissioner Dennis Deer, um, I, I can't thank you enough. And I know our Rotary Club and all of the employees of the clerk's office have been enriched by this experience that we've had today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now I believe our time is well spent. We can't take any more questions. So God thank bless you. all of you. And again, thank you. Uh, the meeting is now adjourned. Thanks for having me. God bless you all.